Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, so the first presentation we have for this session is a virtual presentation uh, by jo Josh Bamford. G'day, I'm Josh Bamford calling in from sunny Australia and I'm here to talk to you about chance music and why it doesn't actually sound as random as we think it should. For those not aware, uh, chance music is a, a method of musical composition which is uh, supposed to be well, it's supposed to be entirely random. Um, it can be either uh, a predetermined score, which, is, which was generated through a random process, or could have indeterminate elements uh, in, in the composition, such that the composer doesn't have complete control over how it's realised, um, meaning part of it is, is improvised by the performer. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm mostly interested in the, the predetermined score generated by chance. Uh, examples of this would be, say, John Cage's Music of Changes. Uh, on the, on the converse, we have serial music, uh, which is a highly structured method of musical composition. Uh, for example, Schoenberg's 12-tone row system. What I'm kind of interested in, and I got interested in this when I was, when I was attending a lecture uh, back at the University of Western Australia, looking at chants and serial music. Um, and we were discussing them in the same lecture, and one of the things that our lecturer did was play us a piece of chants music and a piece of serial music, and asked us to tell the difference. Uh, so I'm going to replicate that here now. Uh, have a listen to, to this. Alright, that was the first example, and the second example. So, any guesses? Raise your hand if you think the first one was composed purely by chance. And if you think the second one was? So of course I can't see uh, what you were doing, but what I expected to find was that most of you would get this wrong. So let's find out. Uh, the first piece was in fact Structures for Two Pianos by Pierre Boulet, uh, which is a strictly serialist piece of music. And the second one was Music of Changes by John Cage. Um, if you got that right, you know, good on you. Uh, if you identified the piece, even better. Uh, what, I, what we found, though, when, when I saw this purely anecdotally, was that most people got this quite wrong, which I think is really interesting. Isn't it cool that a piece that is actually composed using quite strict structures um, is perceived as being much more random than a piece that is really composed by random? Um, and it raises some interesting questions about how we perceive randomness. Many of you are probably familiar with chaos theory, uh, in which you can get something that is seemingly random, um, but actually is produced by a very complex process. Um, and here you can see a, a good example of that, um, and it's a classic function of chaos theory, in which um, all sorts of very, very minuscule events, sort of early down the line, can result in completely different results uh, at the end of the process. Um, but essentially, a sense of chaos can emerge from uh, quite non-random processes, just more complex than we, can, than we can comprehend. What this alludes to is a difference in process and product uh, in randomness and the way it's perceived. So you can have things that look very random, um, but were not generated by a random process, and you can also have things that were generated by a random process, which actually don't appear very random. And a classic example of this is in coin flipping. So a few experiments have been done looking at the way people uh, both perceive a series of coin flips and generate an artificial series of coin flips. Here you can see two examples of sequences of heads and tails. 
there's the same probability of both of these different sequences occurring. To get this exact sequence of coin flips would be the same chance. Um, but the first of these is generally perceived as more random by most average humans. Uh, and the first is also more likely to be produced if you ask someone to produce an artificial random series of coin flips. What people seem to do is they assume it should, there should be a reversal more often. So you can never get a long series of heads in a row. People always assume it should be like heads, tails, heads, tails, so it's evenly distributed. But actually, there's, that doesn't have to be the case at all. So my, um, my experiment, uh, I guess, fills a gap in that no one's tested our perception of random events in the medium of sound before. There's been these nice experiments looking at heads and tails, um, but does this carry over to sound, and does this explain why people think that chance music is less random than serial music? So I, I, um, I want to test the hypothesis that participants should be unable to distinguish between 12-tone rows and random sequences of 12 notes, scoring at chance level on a forced choice task. So my, my hypothesis is just that they can't tell the difference um, between chants and serial music. Uh, I aim to test this using um, 16 pieces of serial music and 16 pieces of chants music, uh, both of which were highly controlled, uh, just sequences of 12 notes, um, either composed by myself according to 12 tone row principles, uh, or composed by the Randy function in MATLAB. Um, these were presented in random pairings, um, so you hear um, one, one of these sequences of 12 notes and then another one, and it's a forced choice task, so you have to pick which one sounded more random to you. Uh, select the melody that sounds the most random was the instruction I gave people. Uh, if you'd like to hear examples of those, this is a chance uh, sequence. be a pause and you'd hear and I listened to these more times than I would really care to remember um, and, and so after this they would indicate which one they thought the chance piece was and in this case it was the first one um, interestingly enough uh, they actually did a lot worse than chance um, most most of my participants so you can see here in, our, in this beautiful graph, um, the, the red line is the expected median of the sample. If they were really just guessing, uh, then they've got a 50-50 chance of getting each one right. There were 16 trials, so you'd expect them to get eight of them right if they were just guessing. But in point of fact, uh, they did a lot worse than this, with a median of about six. Um, and consistently, people are answered worse than chance level, uh, indicating that they may have actively thought that the serial uh, stimuli in this case uh, sounded more random to them than, than the, the melody that was actually composed by a random number generator. This is interesting and it highlights that the product of a more random process may in fact sound less random. Here's a, a sort of visual inspection of two of the stimuli presented and what I suspect if you look at these is that actually the serial piece looks a bit more evenly distributed than the chance piece. In the chance piece, you actually get clusterings of notes and repeated notes, uh, which you don't get because of the constraints of the 12-tone row composition principle. And I think it might be these repetitions that are throwing people off, because when you hear a repeated note, you infer that there must be some more structure, or at least a greater sense of tonality, uh, which in point of fact is what Schoenberg wanted to avoid when he developed the 12-tone row method. He was actively avoiding a sense of tonality by evenly distributing the notes. But of course, if you have random independent events, there is actually quite a high probability that you will get repetition. Uh, and th this speaks to what's known as the birthday problem uh, in probability. So th this is th the birthday problem is to determine uh, what, what chance there is of two people in a room having the same birthday as each other. Um, assuming that birthdays are entirely independent random events, which day of the year you're born on, um, it's surprising how high it is that you could be sharing a birthday with someone. In fact, in, in so common calculations of the birthday problem, uh, usually you'd expect that if you had 23 people uh, in a room, there's about a 50-50 chance that 
two of those people would share a birthday. So I'm not sure how many people are here watching this session, but uh, you, can, you can probably figure it out using this calculation, uh, what probability it is that two of you probably share a birthday with each other. It's something to discuss afterwards, if you'd like, in the coffee break. Um, <clears throat> and we can apply this just the same way to our chance compositions. Uh, we have 12 notes to choose from, rather than 365 days of the year. So we replace the 365 with a 12, we get this new function, and then we're selecting 12 notes from this set of 12 notes, so we put in n of 12, and it turns out that we have a 99.9% .9 chance of having a repeated note somewhere in, in our little sequence. Um, in point of fact, that number is something like 99.9999 and then gibberish. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty high probability you're going to get repetitions, as opposed to um, our more constrained condition of the serial tone row that I composed, um, which has no repeated notes by its very design. So, to conclude, it does appear that the product of a more random process may sound less random, in particular circumstances such as this, uh, and this is possibly due to the presence of repeated notes, as in the birthday problem. Of course, what I was doing here was looking at a very controlled set of stimuli, they are only 12 notes, uh, and this is not representative of of sort of proper 12-tone serialist music, uh, in which case the tone row is repeated. So I mean, the, the, the idea behind 12-tone music is that the listener should be able to identify with a tone row and observe how it is transformed over the whole course of the music, which you don't get in this experiment. Um, however, others have looked at people's memory for tone rows and how they perceive tone row structures in a larger piece of music and generally find that audiences are pretty bad at identifying them and identifying their transformations. Um, so I think this kind of adds, um, adds weight to previous criticism of 12-tone music that audiences perhaps are not perceiving tone rows as a musical structure as intended. And finally, I guess to conclude, it does seem that in fact having more rules can make things appear to be less random than the more uncontrolled state of having independent random events. Which means that serialism is somewhat better at sounding random than truly random music. <laughs> Okay, we're just going to quickly do a changeover for setting up for the live Skype session. <laughs> Hello Josh, can you hear me okay? Hey, how you doing? Very well. <laughs> and this is Susie, that your chair for today. Hello. Oh, can, you, Susie. can you hear us okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Fantastic, right. Yeah, we're we're going to go for questions then. Do we have any questions? Oh, uh, right, Josh, we've got an issue. I'm just going to have to shut our video off, okay? But you, oh, okay, sure. you can hear us, and hopefully that will sort it out. Okay, let's carry on. Okay. So, so there's be some questions coming now, I believe. Okay, can you hear me? Fantastic. Hang on, no, we can't. Can you hear me? Just one second, Josh. There's a question going to come in a minute. Which, which one is it? Hello? There we go. Alright. Uh, right. Right. Okay. Hi. A uh, really intriguing yeah. presentation. Nice animations and stuff. Actually, I was. Uh, I would like to ask whether the uh, melody had less than 12 notes. And, for example, have 6 or 9 notes. And if the randomness appeared in less notes, maybe if it had a tonal implication. What do you think? <laughs> So you mean if, um, if I chose a melody of, of fewer notes, yeah. um, do you think I'd see the same effect? Yeah. The, yeah, um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I chose 12 notes, I guess, for obvious reasons, because a 12 tone row is 12 notes long. Um, but it was really, I, mean, I, had to, <clears throat> I should preface by saying that you know, this, this, um, this study was a little bit outside my usual sphere of expertise. It was a bit of a, a sort of side project, I thought, it, which might be fun to test. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, it would be really interesting to do it, I think, with different lengths, because um, obviously the probability of having repeated notes is less if you have fewer notes. Um, yeah. So people may be less able to distinguish um, if you have fewer than 12, perhaps. Yeah, and I, another thought I had it was if the, the listener had all perfect pitch, 
since he would understand the repetition of a note and which mm -hmm. notes sure. are there. No. Yeah, none of my participants uh, reported having perfect pitch. Um, it would be interesting to see if they had. Um, yeah, I'd have to recruit some who, yeah, who did. But, um, would be really interesting. Yeah, all good for the study. <laughs> really exciting. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Another question coming your way now. <laughs> Hello, Josh. It's very interesting, and um, I did some work in my undergrad actually with atonal music, so it's really nice to see it used in a setting like this. Um, uh, great for using uh, twelve tone rows was really great. I was wondering um, if you would ever do kind of a similar study or thought about using other kinds of atonal music, which does use repeated notes but still might sound more similar to the chance music. Um, like I was one composer, I was thinking in particular some works by Elliot Carter, whose music does sound quite random and left to chance, but there's very strict mathematical paradigms that he uses. Um, so just wondering about that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think, you know, tone rows are easy, um, so it's a good place to start. Yeah, I'd love to do more comparisons between serial music and chance music um, in a more general sense. And I guess I should say that, like, I, I did, um, as a first step, I did replicate that experiment that I, I kind of showed you at the start of the um, presentation using the, um, the piece by Boulez and the, um, the piece by Cage. Um, and so people, yeah, as a kind of pilot run to this pilot that I presented, um, I did use real excerpts um, from real pieces. Uh, I wanted to have a more controlled condition uh, in this partic particular experiment. Um, so it was you know, these kind of 12 mini sounds in a row. Um, but yeah, no, I think like now, now that I've established this effect works in a very controlled setting, it would be great to use sort of real music. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we're just going to see if there's any more questions. There's another couple coming your way, thick and fast. How many? <laughs> there's another ready mic here. There's no one else available to. Yeah, where, where is he okay, going? Uh, hello. Okay, here we go. Uh, I wanted to ask if the participants were aware of the 12-tone serial rules of not, not repeating tones. Sure. Um, I, I did ask people... Um, if, firstly, I should say that all most of my participants were music students. Uh, I forget if I said in the, in the presentation. Um, although most of them had little to no knowledge of serial and chance music and hadn't performed it before and weren't, weren't kind of you know, enthusiasts of, of the genre so much. Um, so yeah, when, when I discussed it with people um, after in a sort of debriefing session, no one, no one really picked up on what was going on except for, actually I think I, I had a non-musician who was taking part who did actually pick up on it and said, oh yeah, some of these have repeated notes um, and I think that's what that's what made up my mind. I also had one person who told me that she picked up on the, um, the fact that there were repeated notes and then thought that those must be the ones that were composed by chance because if you have chance events, then it's quite likely that you'll get repetitions. Um, and so this, this participant was aware of that. Uh, nonetheless, they still got all of them wrong. <laughs> so, so actually being aware of, of this effect didn't seem to improve people's performance. Um, so I suspect it's something quite sort of subconscious, implicit. Okay, because that was my conclusion also, that if there were repeated notes, it, it, it's more probably that it was chance music. Thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. Okay, we've got a question down in the front here. Oh. This is from Peter. Yep. Hi Josh, thank you for the great presentation. Um, you said several times a very reasonable hypothesis, which is that uh, the percept of chance um, or not chance was really uh, quite a lot down to the phenomenon of repeated notes. I guess there are other potential salient phenomena that also might be relevant here. In particular, I'm thinking uh, the clarity of a tonal center is something um, that you're really constrained not to have. And you actually mentioned that as being a principle of Schoenberg's uh, experiments, you know, was trying to avoid tonal center. Maybe participants were finding that as well. Um, yeah, um, 
Yeah, I, I think absolutely. And I, I believe those two are probably connected. I mean, I, yeah. I, I understand that Schoenberg's, um, Schoenberg's idea was to not repeat notes, and thus to avoid a tonal center, or to make sure that notes were repeated, um, you know, were given equal weighting uh, in composition as a whole. Um, so I think the lack of repetitions probably relates to the to the tonal center uh, or lack thereof. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Is there any more questions? Okay. I think we're just going to say thank you so much. That went flawlessly. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.